Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. bond 
with my teacher. For me, my teacher was someone who knew the way to school. Someone who knew the way to the place of learning. Not only did she know the way, she led the way. She led us to school. And I followed. Every day, without fail, like a shepherd, she would lead us out to school and lead us back home. <laughs> Whether going or coming, the child was left behind. Like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, my teacher was careful. Careful that not one of the children entrusted to her care got lost. This shepherd teacher was every pain for us. And she took care of us in every way possible. Even at that age, I was always fascinated by how she seemed to find time for every child in her school. Although we were many of us, at all times, I felt I was at the center of everything my teacher did. From being shepherded to school, being cared for, to being nurtured maternally, I was the center of it all. Could always count on the personal attention, encouragement, and dedication of my teacher. She cared about and nourished my body, mind, and spirit. She was interested in my whole person. She was interested above all in who I was becoming. As I think about it now, it makes me wonder, what if, what if the art of education was like shepherding and accompanying those entrusted to us along the path of knowledge, truth, and discovery? We would not be the inventors of these art. Instead, we would be imitators of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. I say the school I went to as a five-year-old is called Gary School. Gary is staple food in West Africa. It is made from cassava, a tropical tuber that grows in many West African countries. Gary is dry, a dry, gritty, and granular flour that can be made into a stiff dough, and eaten with sauce. The closest family resemblance to Gary would be couscous. Every morning, and this was how it got its name, every morning as we were headed off to school, my mother would measure a handful of Gary into my pocket. And if I was lucky, I also got a few roasted peanuts to chew on when time came to eat my Gary. Gary was particularly suited for this kind of school. At school, snacks were not provided. No chocolates, no candies, no cookies. After eating, or rather after swallowing some dry Gary, I would drink some water. And as the gari absorbed the water in my stomach, it would expand. The end 
examples and I felt very fooled. Fool enough to last the entire day at school. There was something else about my Gary school. We did not have books. We did not have pencils. And we did not have pens. I know this may sound surprising to some, even shocking, but it's true. There are no books, no pencils, no pens. You might wonder, so what did we write on all week? We had wooden slates. <laughs> <laughs> We had wooden slates. Every morning, I carried a wooden slate to school. The slate was a flat piece of wood, measuring about eight inches wide and 10 inches long and about a quarter of an inch thick. To give you a picture of what I'm talking about, think about my slate as your morning tablet or iPad, which some of you are sporting here. Except that the one I used at school was made of wood. But who cares? A tablet is a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> to write on a slate, I use a small piece of chalk that will be measured and broken and handed to me by my mother every morning. But oftentimes, we would run out of chalk. And then, what would we use? We would use charcoal, a piece of charcoal, to write on our slates. Charcoal, as you know, is black. So that was my stylus. As you can imagine, we did not have chairs or desks either. Everybody sat on the floor with a slate on your laps. There wasn't much you could write on a small slate. But amazingly, it was on this small wooden tablet that I learned to write English. And I learned the basic arithmetic of addition Subtraction, division, and multiplication. Recently, I received an application from a young man desiring to enter the Society of Jesus and become a priest. As I read his account of his early education, I could not but think how similar his experience was to mine. And this is what he wrote. About my education, I began schooling in 1991 at a local village school. I was still too tiny to take myself to school, and therefore I would be carried by my sister on her back to and from school. We used to write on the soil, that is, on the ground, with a piece of stick and on banana leaves, after which the teacher would come to inspect our work. Writing on the soil was fun, since we could easily modify our work. <laughs> Writing on banana leaves was not easy, for one needed extra much care of the delicate books, that is, the banana leaves. Any carelessness could tear the books, the books were not expensive, but it meant they would not last long enough for us to see how we used to fare in our early stages of education. This young man's story of his early education, being carried to school by an older sibling, writing on the bare floor or using banana leaves as exercise books will be similar to that of many Africans my age and older where I come from. <coughs> As 
Because I recall it when I first went to school, there were many challenges to overcome. But education helped me to realize that these obstacles were not insurmountable. When we did not have books, we used slates or banana leaves. When pencils, pens, and chalk were lacking, we used pieces of charcoal. When there were no chairs or desks, we carried them on our heads from our school, from our house to school, and from school back to our house. As I recall now, it makes me wonder, what if? What if the art of education was about making the impossible possible? Creating new opportunities, enabling latent capabilities, discovering wider horizons, crossing new frontiers, stimulating limitless creativity. In the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, education is the engine through which development can be powered both for the individual in opening up new opportunities, as well as for countries seeking to move out of the fierce grip of poverty. After completing one year of Gary School, I was enrolled in what we call primary school or equivalent of grade school. To qualify for primary school, we did not have to write an entrance exam. Instead, each kid had to take a physical test. It was a simple test. I had to place my right arm above my head and touch my left ear. If I could touch my left ear, I was qualified to begin primary school. <laughs> but I failed that test. <laughs> I failed it. But the headmaster was considerate, and he made an exception. And so, I wasn't left behind. Speaking of not being left behind, something else that I remember most about going to school as a five-year-old. It seemed to take forever to get to school and back home. To get to school, we must have crisscrossed the entire neighborhood. So if you were the first kid to be picked up or the last kid to be dropped off, it meant you literally had to visit the homes of all the other kids before you got to school or got back home. The good thing was that none of us had to do that daily round trip alone. We always traveled to school as a group. Several kids from the same neighborhood joined together for the long march to school and the long march back home from school. And now as I look back, it dawns on me that truly in our journey is our education. As I remember it, from the very first day I went to school, I was always part of a community. The journey to Gary School and back, I did not travel that road alone. Besides the teacher, there was always a community of kids with whom I made the journey. We supported one another, cared for one another, and I remember we shared our little portion of Gary with kids who were not fortunate enough 
to get their daily ration. Dropping by on one another at home every day was part of going to school. The whole neighborhood, the whole neighborhood had become my school. We looked out for each other so that nobody was left behind. Going to school at that age meant that none of us, none of us would ever have to walk alone. And as I think and recall back now, it makes me wonder, what if? What if the art of education was a journey of creating community? A community of solidarity, compassion, friendship, and mutual support. What if? It's a long time ago now since I first went to Gary's school. Forty years to be precise. As I look back on my experience from Gary's school through the subsequent stages of education, many things stood out for me. Many things. Many things about what I now believe education is really about. As a Jesuit, I've come to value very much the importance of good education. Education was worth all of the sacrifice that we had to make to get it. We could never put a price on the value of education. I am grateful now for all the years of schooling and all the challenges that came with those years. They've made me who I am today, that is, a learner for life. The Society of Jesus and its army of partners and collaborators and friends here represented today has been involved in providing good quality and affordable education for over 450 years on all the continents of the world. As a universal community, we have recorded tremendous success in our network of schools in many parts of the world. You know more than I do how influential Jesuit education has been since 1548. In the U.S. alone, where we are now, <coughs> countless number of Jesuit schools, like Boston College High, work in the tradition of Ignatian pedagogy to form women and men for others rooted in faith that does justice and reconciles people. As Emmanuel mentioned, I come from a province of Eastern Africa. And there are six countries in this province. We have four Jesuit high schools, as Danny mentioned yesterday, and two primary schools in the province. In a population of close to 250 million people, this represents a tiny drop in a vast ocean of need. Our school in Wau, South Sudan, whose headmaster is here present, is located in a region where there was a civil war that lasted for more than 20 years. Even now, some people say the war never ended. During the 20 years of war, Loyola Secondary School was closed. Because the classrooms were used by the military of North Sudan as a base camp for conducting raids on rebel territories in the south of the country. Unfortunately, four years ago, 
The army left the school and we were able to renovate and to reopen it. Today, as we speak, some of the 200 students of Loyola Secondary School in Wahau, South Sudan, are ex-soldiers <coughs> who fought in the Civil War as child soldiers. <coughs> to come to this conference, I traveled from our high school, Oche County and Jesuit College in Guru, Northern Uganda. Oche is located at the heart of a region where a notorious and vicious rebel group killed and mutilated thousands of children, women, and men, abducted young boys as child soldiers and young girls as sex slaves, and sent millions of people fleeing from their homes as refugees and internally displaced people. Perhaps some of you have heard about the Lord's Resistance Army in the recent YouTube posting, Tony 2012. Whether in Gul or Wal, Boston, Lima, Lagos, Sydney, Paris, Kinshasa, Cordoba, Barcelona, or Mexico City, no matter the context or the challenges, I believe now that Jesuit education is about making a difference in the lives of these children. Leading them along a path that will change their lives and the world around them for good. I began this reflection by sharing with you my experience of education as a child. Again, as I look back on that experience, I am grateful for the opportunities I had. Dedicated teachers, limited but appropriate school materials, a community of fellow students with whom I journeyed daily to and from school. Above all, I'm grateful today that I was never left behind. On the western coast of the modern African state of Ghana, stands a 15th century castle known as Elmina Castle. Elmina is a slave castle. As any European castle of its times, this imposing edifice boasts an intricate architecture of chambers and suites and watchtowers, banquet halls, balconies, and a chapel. There are several such slave castles, forts, and fortresses along the entire coastline of Africa. They share one thing in common in their architecture. Each castle, fort, or fortress has what is commonly called the door of no return. In the belly of the castle of Elmina lies an expansive courtyard. But something about this courtyard has come to define what the castle stands for in the history of man's inhumanity to man. The courtyard doubles as a dungeon, a holding cell for hundreds, thousands of women, men and children, on what for the so-called New World, to face a harrowing future of brutality, captivity, and slavery. The courtyard opens up to a loading bay on the Atlantic Ocean. From the dungeon where they were held, abused, tortured, and molested in all manner of ways, these slaves were shoved through the door of no return, to endure their treacherous journey across the Atlantic. Once they walked through that door, their faith was sealed. 
There was no returning from the misery, captivity, and slavery on the other side of the Atlantic. There were commodities to be traded, branded, and held in captive labor for the rest of their lives. It just makes me wonder, as I think of it, what if, what if the art of educating a child was like leading him or her through a door of no return? Unlike the door of no return in Elmina Castle, leading a child through the door of education represents the liberation of the human spirit. It's empowering the child to deplore and to savor the finest manifestations of the human spirit. I recall the words of Julio Sinierere, former president of Tanzania. We say we are created in the image of God. I refuse to imagine a God who is poor, ignorant, superstitious, fearful, oppressed, wretched, which is a lot of the majority of those created in God's image. <laughs> Education is the art of imagining and achieving everything that the castle of Elmina stands for. Elmina Castle was built in 1482. As a nation family of schools, since 1548 in Messina, Sicily, who've been leading countless people through the door of no return. Liberating the human mind from the captivity of poverty, ignorance, superstition, fear, oppression, injustice, recreating women and men in the image of God. Restoring women, men and children to their original state as Imago Dei. The good news is that today, my friends, through your ministry of education, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your ear.
May our loving God bless us all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you.